Hello there, and welcome to another of the Spink Medal Department uh, podcasts. So I hope you're all sitting comfortably. And uh, this podcast is actually going to come from the terrible trio, so you'll hear from me first. Um, I'll then hand over to um, our new intern, uh, Harry. And uh, finally, Robert will uh, see us home. So uh, we're here to talk about the uh, auction happening on the 8th and 9th of December. We've got um, best part of 1,600 lots, so again, another bumper catalogue, uh, all online, and bids are flooding in already, which is, which is good to know. And um, I think I will just show you a few of me, uh, my favourite lots and um, just give you a brief overview of what the sale comprises. So the first 190 lots uh, include the special collections, and um, we've made a special PDF which is available online. And um, that includes uh, the honours and awards and a magnificent archive of uh, Lieutenant General Sir Charles Dobell. Um, also includes the flying awards and uh, film awards of um, the very famous Huey Green, which you'll all know from Opportunity Knox. Um, we've got the exploration collection of Penn Haddo for his um, 2003 uh, North, Pole, North Pole solo expedition. Uh, we've got a lovely run of um, uh, gallantry, campaign and single awards uh, from the collection of the late Major Tony Sudlow, 10th uh, Gurkhas, uh, sold on behalf of his family. And um, towards the end of that section, we've also got a number of paintings uh, sold by order of Sir Ranulph Fiennes, uh, raising funds uh, for the Scots Dragoon Guards Museum in Edinburgh. And the final lot of that special section um, is the magnificent um, Iraqi order of Saddam Quesadilla sword, um, which is pretty striking. So do go and have a look at that online. And um, hopefully by the time uh, viewing uh, will be possible, uh, in line with government advice. So come in and wield Saddam's sword if you dare. And now I'm just going to show you a few of my favourite lots and begin with lot 184, which is the superb Afghanistan um, Operation Herrick 5 uh, MC Group of Six awarded to Lance Bombardier Jennings, uh, a Green Beret uh, from 29 Commando Regiment Royal Artillery. Um, a forward air controller. Um, his MC was awarded uh, for a spate of actions um, in the heat of battle um, and stemmed mainly from the action of the 3rd of March 2007 in the centre of Sangin when uh, his three-man uh, party were fired upon and he was the sole survivor from the action um, coming under heavy uh, advance fire from the Taliban. Just a few days later, um, the replacement crew, uh, a, a further member was killed and again Jennings was straight into the action and to bring fire to, to, to get themselves out of that situation. So that's, that's a fantastic group of awards. Uh, he had also previously uh, been awarded the American Commendation Medal for service in Kosovo. And um, the group is, 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 um, is very extensive. The archive it comes with is, is full of story and full of history. And um, it carries a pre-sale estimate of 10 to 12,000. So we'll see what happens with that on the day. Um, Jennings also saw further service in Iraq. Um, so again, it's a pretty complete group. And if you're into modern groups or the Royal Artillery, um, well worth a look and well worth a bid too. Um, we'll now go on to the Royal Air Force. And um, in the 80th anniversary of Battle of Britain year, um, it's fitting that a number of rather impressive Battle of Britain groups have come along. Um, and, and this one is, is a pick from the sale for me. Uh, this is the DSO, DFC and Bar, Battle of Britain veterans, um, group of six to uh, Flight Lieutenant Wilbur Berridge. Um, Berridge flew uh, and was one of the few during the battle and um, then created one of the most successful night fighter um, partnerships um, with uh, Wing Commander Topham. Uh, the pair of them notched up no less than 13 kills in both fighters of number 219 squadron and the mosquitoes a little bit later with number 125 squadron. And um, again, uh, for me, it's a really interesting group. Uh, we've got his, his logbook and um, also you've got the, the bonus of the named medal on the end, uh, his air efficiency. Uh, it's all written up online. And it's just a really complete group um, to, a, to a night fighter ace. Well, you know, what more could you want? Um, again, um, lot 298, it carries a pre-sale estimate of 10 to 12,000. And again, well worth a bid. 
we'll now go back um, back in time a little bit and um, I, I thought I would have to bring out lot 338 uh, that is the campaign group of four uh, to Major Rokeby Robinson. Um, for me, this, um, this is what might be termed by a number of the African collectors as a bit of a grand slam. Um, you've got the double issue East and West Africa for Niger 1897 and later the Sierra Leone operations of 1898 to 9. Um, Rokeby Robinson was a uh, Royal Irish, uh, sorry, yes, a Royal Irish rifleman and was uh, then seconded to the Royal Niger Constabulary and was a district commissioner out there. Um, he also has the, uh, the rare accolade of the, um, the Royal Niger Company medal in silver uh, with clasp Nigeria, 1896 to 1897. Um, a damned rare medal and of course a damn fine quality one because it came from uh, the workshops of um, uh, a Messrs Spink and Son. So a lovely award and um, the Africa interest is high in this one. Uh, Rokeby Robinson then returned uh, for further action with the uh, 13th Imperial Yeomanry during the Boer War as captain and adjutant of that unit. Um, obviously the companies uh, and the servicemen and officers that were drawn into the uh, 13th Imperial Yeomanry are, are well known and known as the millionaire's own. Um, landed gentry full of Etonians and uh, they suffered um, uh, the, uh, their defeat at Lindley in the disastrous action there when they were overwhelmed by Boer artillery and uh, Rokeby Robinson was taken prisoner uh, in the action on the 31st of May 1900 and um, you can see in the photograph of the officers having a spot of lunch he's photographed um, as a prisoner uh, with his ribbons of uh, his other campaign medals. So. Uh, three cracking groups there. Uh, Rokeby Robinson's group is sold as lot 338 and carries a pre-sale estimate of just three to four thousand, uh, which is an absolute snip. So um, I trust you'll be getting your bidding fingers ready for that. So uh, three three groups of things you'd expect us to sell. And um, I'd like to just draw your attention now um, to a special collection which we've taken on. Uh, that is the Solo North Pole uh, collection of Penhaddo. Um, this collection is um, comprised about 30 lots and covers all the equipment, uh, the personal diaries, logbooks uh, of Penn for his 2003 expedition. Um, this is an unsurpassed expedition, had never been done before and will probably never be done again. Um, he left Ward Hunt Island in Canada, having got the, the um, the relevant permissions from the Canadian authorities and made his nearly 500 mile mission uh, in 64 days um, crossing uh, the Arctic wastes up to the North Pole. Uh, during that time uh, he had to uh, jump into a, an immersion suit uh, dubbed Mr Orange and that is sold uh, as part of the collection um, to cross the open flows between the ice. So he was doing that regularly uh, highly dangerous work, um, dodging polar bears, uh, the conditions were, as you'd expect of those regions, absolutely appalling. Um, this collection came to us following the uh, hugely successful um, 200 years of polar exploration ex uh, exhibition we held here last year and um, Penn is selling uh, these personal artefacts uh, for a most worthy cause. Um, to provide funds for his uh, charity, the 90 North Unit, uh, which is raising funds for the unique ecosystem uh, that exists uh, in, in, over, across the Arctic Ocean. And uh, it's a real privilege to have got to know Penn over the last few months and to have handled his, his, his items. So um, I can't sit here in his sledge, but that is downstairs in the vault and uh, the sledge which he, he hauled all that way is, is sold as one of the lots. Um, two items which I think for me um, are worth uh, bringing and are easily uh, shown to you on this little video are the simple compass uh, used by him to navigate the whole way. Um, so uh, this compass, without it, Penn would not have got there. It's a key item in the collection. Um, so again, do go online and have a look at that. And another thing which, you know, touches, touches our hearts is the personal diaries. Um, a couple of years ago, um, Spink uh, sold the 
uh, pocket diary of uh, Captain Scott um, and made uh, in excess of 20,000. Um, well, here we have Pen Haddo's personal pocket diary um, giving all of his insights, but also his movements, what, where he's going, what he's seeing, how he's feeling. Um, and that, together with um, the other logbooks from his other two expeditions, again, are sold in the collection. So that really is something which I'd implore you all to go and have a look at. Um, besides the 2003 expedition, we also cover um, there's a small section of objects uh, from Sir Wally Herbert, which was given to Penn um, as a result of his um, organisation for the um, testimonial given to Sir Wally um, at the RGS uh, back in 2006. So uh, slightly off, off what we might be usually doing, um, but a, a most interesting subject and something which I hope you'll all enjoy reading about. Um, obviously, we are the, the auction comprises uh, not just uh, DSOs for the you know for fighter pilots and MCs for Afghanistan. Uh, we've also got a good and really wide-ranging selection of uh, world orders and decorations this time. Um, it's been a good year for 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 good overseas orders here at Spink, and um, I thought I'd just show you a couple of um, couple of my choice items. So, lot thirteen ninety two is the order of Sultan Qaboos. Uh, this is a first-class set, so you've not only got the breast star, but you also have the sash badge. Uh, both of those um, set with paste stones, and um, rather a moving item, obviously, with the sad passing of the Sultan in January of this year. Um, this set of insignia, uh, again, of the highest quality. It's out of the Spink workshops, um, and is um, you know has obviously passed through collectors' hands and has now come onto the market. And um, uh, it's lot 1392. Um, it carried a pre-sale estimate of 14 to 1800. Uh, I checked on to Spink Live this morning, see where we were. Uh, we're already at 2100 at the time of um, filming this. So um, do go online and, and give it a nudge. Um, it's, a, it's a lovely set of insignia. And one of the very final lots of the sale, um, you know, exotic orders. And um, I think none more exotic uh, than Zanzibar. Um, the Order of the Brilliant Star, again, a first-class set of insignia. Um, so you've, you've seen the, um, the breast star and here the collar badge. Uh, Parisian made, um, superb gold centres and um, just a beautiful piece of insignia. And um, that's lot uh, 1574. And uh, again, I logged on to Spink Live and you can forget my estimate of five to six hundred. We're already at four and a half thousand pounds. Uh, at the time of filming this. So um, let's see what happens uh, on the 9th of December when, when those two lots are sold. So thank you very much for uh, bearing with my a few stories from me. And uh, I'll now pass over to Harry. Thank you. Um, thank you, Marcus, for that lovely introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Harry, the new medals intern uh, with the medal department. Um, and I am looking forward to working with you all at some point uh, in the next few months. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today about a couple of lots. Uh, the first is a uh, very distinguished and very expansive CB DSO and Bar MC lot of 13, spanning the Great War, Second World War, and uh, the Mau Mau Uprising. Uh, it was awarded to Philip Stafford Myberg of the Royal Artillery. Um, he was a second lieutenant at the beginning of the First World War, serving with the 42nd Brigade. He won his MC in 1916 and his DSO in 1919. He came away from the war with a trio of mentioned and dispatches, and he was a captain by the end. Uh, at the beginning of the Second War is when we start to see uh, a little more of him. Uh, he was a lieutenant colonel serving with the 70th Division, and he wins a bar to his DSO during Operation Crusader when, and his citation is wonderfully specific, he is in command of three regiments of horse artillery, two regiments of field artillery, and a regiment of anti-tank guns, and, and I'm quoting here, many captured enemy guns. Unfortunately, Operation Crusader was a very confused battle for the British and indeed the Germans, and artillery commanders were often being required to drop shells 
behind their own lines because units have been encircled and even called on to undertake fire missions behind them because the lines were moving so much and everything was so fluid. But the fact that he wins both the bar to his DSO in this battle and also uh, a promotion to brigadier uh, is, I think, a uh, good indication of how well uh, Mayberg was able to perform under such intense pressure. In 1941, 70th Division and Mayberg moved to India and he was serving on the headquarters staff of four corps during the Battle of Imphal, the crucial battle in which the British prevented the Japanese invasion through Burma into India. It's here that he has awarded his CBE for his ability in organizing the defense of Imphal, the Imphal Plain, as well as boosting morale amongst the relatively untrained uh, British Army amongst the relatively inexperienced British Army and uh, working with various different branches of the army present uh, at headquarters to try and um, working to try and create cohesion amongst the various different elements present at headquarters. Not unreasonably, having been through both world wars, uh, Mayberg chose to retire in 1946. However, his group was not yet then complete, uh, and he was later awarded an AGSM of the Kenya uh, clasp for his actions whilst an honorary colonel in Kenya. Uh, he had inherited land out there on, on the death of Philip Sidney Myberg, possibly a relation, um, and presumably was a part of either a member of a defence force or maybe even just an honorary colonel, however, he did get the medal. Right, the next lot I'm going to talk about is to Engineer Lieutenant John Garrow. Uh, it is a relatively innocuous looking pair, uh, Great War and Victory Medal. Uh, however, it does have an interesting story behind it. John Garrow served on HMS Kent during the Battle of the Fulton's Islands in December 1914. Um, the British at the time were fighting the German East Asia Squadron. Um, and if you're wondering why the East Asia Squadron was in the Fulton's Islands, I urge you to look it up. It is a magnificent story. Uh, however, the British had recently been defeated by the squadron, the Battle of Coronel of Chile, leading to the destruction of two armoured cruisers and the death of British Admiral Craddock. Uh, this was something of a blow to morale for the British, who considered the Navy to be our uh, strongest asset. And so, uh, it was decided a squadron should be assembled to try and destroy the German East Asia Squadron uh, and reclaim British uh, pride. Um, the Kent was part of the squadron which assembled at the Fulton Islands and, uh, um, and the British squadron was just uh, trying to work out how they were going to be able to catch this uh, fast-moving German squadron in uh, the South Atlantic, a very large area, when the German fleet appeared heading straight for the Fulton's Islands on what turned out to be a rather ill-advised raid on the refueling station there. The British immediately set off in pursuit uh, with HMS Kent leading the way out of the harbour. Um, the German fleet scattered uh, in an attempt to well, preserve itself and um, was picked off largely one by one, the German capital ship, uh, the German flagship Scharnhorst and uh, the Nassau were both sunk by British battle cruisers and the Kent found itself pursuing the light cruiser Nuremberg. The Nuremberg was faster than the Kent and while not quite so heavily armed, still very, very capable ship, uh, the Kent has, the, the Kent was an old ship uh, and had not been refueled. Uh, the Kent was an old ship, and whilst the British fleet had been refueling at the Fulton's Islands, it had not been refueled itself, and so was running very low on fuel. Uh, the order was given for all wooden objects aboard to be broken up to feed the furnaces so that the British could overhaul the Nuremberg. Uh, and they succeeded in getting, allegedly succeeded in getting to a speed of 25 knots. Um, 
this unfortunately made accuracy very, very difficult. The, this unfortunately made ac accuracy very, very difficult. So when the Nuremberg turned, presenting its full complement of guns to the Kent, rather than turning themselves to match the manoeuvre, they simply ploughed straight on ahead to get as close as possible to the Nuremberg and be sure that they could hit it. The result of this was the Kent took a very heavy pounding, getting 49 shell, being hit 49 times uh, in the course of the battle. Uh, they did, however, succeed in defeating Nuremberg. They did, however, succeed in uh, sinking the Nuremberg, which struck its colours at 6.30 and was sunk by 7.30. 17 crew members were picked up. During the battle, uh, one of the Kent's complement, Sergeant Mays, uh, was awarded the Conspicuous Gallantry Medal. At the time of this battle, uh, John Garrow was a warrant engineer, uh, and while we can't say for certain what he was doing, it is fair to say that he was almost certainly involved in uh, keeping the ship running during this incredible chase. Uh, the Kent itself went on to destroy the last elements of the uh, German East Asia Squadron at the Battle of Masatera, where SMS Dresden was hunted down and the pride of the British Navy restored with its sinking. I'll now hand you over to Robert. With the thanks to Marcus and Harry, I'm here to finish off our little roundup of some of our favourite lots from the upcoming sale. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to start with the real star lots of this sale, in my opinion at least, the fantastic medal group and indeed ex extensive archive of um, Lieutenant General Sir Charles Dobell that you may remember Marcus mentioned earlier. Um, Dobell, an absolutely fascinating character, um, he was Canadian by birth and went to the Canadian Military College uh, and then joined the British Army. In fact, the reason he joined the British Army was because he passed out amongst the top of the cadets at the college at that time and joined none other than the famous Royal Welsh Fusiliers. Uh, with which he saw extensive service. Now, as you can see from his medal group, um, it reflects very, very long and, um, and important service to his country. So we have a DSO, obviously, to start, India General Service, Queen South Africa, that he was involved in the relief of Pekin, um, an Africa General Service medal, Great War service as well, of course, uh, and lots more besides. So lot 36 covers his medals. Um, it also covers his orders, uh, the Order of the Bath, St. Michael and St. George, the Légion d'Honneur, um, and also rather fun, as I mentioned, because he was involved in the relief of Pekin, his um, Order of the Dragon which, of course, is a sort of semi-official thing instituted by the Americans, um, but really, really lovely to see it all complete on its original suspension. Um, the medals, as one would expect, mounted by Spink and Son. They come in a lovely Spink uh, case. Um, so as well as the medals, however, as I alluded to earlier with the marvellous number of uh, documents, photographs and other associated things to do with Dobell's life. Um, we have, or I have selected a small number of them to share with you. One of the first things I'm going to share with you is this rather fun solid silver goat frontlet um, with a wonderful inscription upon it to say the gift of His Majesty King Edward VII to the 2nd Battalion Royal Welsh Fusiliers. Uh, now, this is one of two goat frontlets in the sale. Um, and as you will see from looking at the catalogue, uh, Dobell was clearly an inveterate collector of stuff. Um, so, uh, so two goat frontlets form part of the sale. This is lot 21 with an estimate of four to five hundred pounds. Um, and you know, I think you'd be hard pressed to find an original Royal Welsh Fusiliers goat frontlet uh, anywhere outside of the Regimental Museum. So to have one up for sale is indeed a rare honour. Another bit of rather fine silver that we have here is this extremely nice um, bit of regimental silver in the form of a soldier 
of Royal West African Frontier Force, which has been subsequently adopted into a racing trophy, probably by Debel himself. Um, it relates to the 1st Battalion Northern Nigeria Regiment, and um, again, is a really, really lovely thing. Uh, you, it's very rare you find such nice bits of regimental silver, again, outside of private collections or indeed regimental museums and other institutions. So this is a fantastic thing. I rate it very highly. Uh, it is lot 30 in our sale and has an estimate of three to four hundred pounds. And I'm rather confident it's going to do much better than that. So finally, uh, going much low in value, but nonetheless, again, really rather good fun, is this South Africa um, tin of chocolate, uh, which, as you may know, the sort of precursor of the more famous Queen Mary's gift tins that were sent out to all the troops during the First World War. The South Africa 1900 tin set the precedent. But the thing I really like about this is it's not just the tin. Uh, because it has in it the original fries chocolate. Um, now, again, find another one. That's my challenge to you. And for a snip at 60 to 80 pounds, I think this is, again, a wonderful thing to have for the, uh, again, the person who is interested in Dobell's career, or indeed the person who is particularly interested in the Boer War. So I don't recall having seen a full tin of Boer War chocolate uh, for sale for a considerable amount of time. So, as I said, I think Dobell's medals are the highlight at 79,000 at lot 36. But, you know, if, they, if you can't quite, can't quite uh, extend your budget to cover, cover the medals, then you might like to consider one of the other objects we have. Uh, along with these, we have photograph albums, we have all sorts of other things. We have flags. Uh, so do look at the catalogue to, to see everything we have to offer. And um, it's the most marvellous collection that has never been on sale before. It's all um, for sale via uh, direct descendant of the family. And um, yeah, it is a collector's dream, in my opinion. So, moving on from Dobell, and in fact, going back in time. Now, those of you who are regulars to our medals podcasts may remember that my particular area of interest is the Napoleonic Wars. So it wouldn't be a medal podcast with me talking without some representation of the Napoleonic era. And I have here a rather fine Waterloo and MGS pair to a gunner, in, or rather a sergeant, in the Royal Horse Artillery. Now, I particularly like this lot because uh, these were awarded to a chap called Sergeant Bacon, and Bacon was a member of I Troop, Royal Horse Artillery. Now, I Troop was very well known during the Napoleonic Wars for taking part in several uh, key actions and indeed making a name for themselves as a troop in those key actions. His Military General Service Medal, seven clasps. Now, one in particular is worthy of mention, that for Fuentes de Honoro, fought in May 1811. Now, at the Battle of Fuentes de Honoro, I Troop Royal Horse Artillery was commanded by Lieutenant Norman Ramsey. Uh, note that name, we'll come back to that a little later. And at one point, a British division had to withdraw across a plain that was being threatened by the French. They had to uh, withdraw to the British main line to sort of uh, bolster uh, the line against the repeated French assaults. Now, I Troop was called into action to support the withdrawal of this British force uh, with gunfire. Now, whilst they were doing so, a squadron of French cavalry had advanced rather close to the battery's position without being noticed. And so the story goes that an officer of the troop noticed the, the French squadron at the moment they decided to charge. This officer gave the order for the troop to be limbered up, but before they could do so, the squadron of French cavalry hit them. And eyewitness accounts uh, state that they believed that the whole battery had been lost in action. However, after a few seconds, a scuffle uh, developed and sort of a cloud of dust and shouting and the sort of steel upon steel of uh, sabres and lances. 
And to the amazement of all, the troop galloped out from amongst the melee of French cavalry and actually galloped off to safety. And uh, the gunners wielding their swords and even the rammers used to ram home the shot of the guns to um, defend themselves from French cavalry. And it is undoubtedly the case that Bacon was there. So covering Waterloo now, and I troop again made a name for themselves, this time under the command of Major Bull. Uh, Ramsey was also present at Waterloo, where he unfortunately was killed in action. Uh, now, I troop was unusual at Waterloo because it was armed solely with 5.5-inch howitzers, a battery of six of them. Most batteries, in fact, all other batteries at Waterloo, had five uh, direct fire guns, either six or nine pounders, and one 5.5-inch howitzer, whereas Bulls was a specialist troop of howitzers only. They were positioned on the main ridge uh, above the Chateau of Hougoumont, uh, for the very reason that they could provide indirect fire to support the chateau in its defence when being assaulted by French troops. And in fact, it is on record that Bull's Battery provided a textbook example of indirect fire uh, at this time. They were specifically ordered no, by no other personage than the Duke of Wellington himself to support the defence of the chateau. And um, again, eyewitness accounts state that they fired shrapnel shot from their howitzers with uh, deadly effect. The fuses on the shells were cut absolutely perfectly. They exploded not before they hit their target, not after, but right over the heads of the French soldiers, causing massive casualties. So um, a really, really well-known action for Bull's troop. And um, again, Sergeant Bacon was there. As an NCO, it's highly likely he commanded at least one of the guns to ensure that they were properly sighted on their targets, on their trajectories, uh, doing the best job they could. And indeed, they got the praise of the Duke of Wellington himself after the battle. So this pair of medals, lot 319, uh, with an estimate of 1,800 to 2,200. And again, I, I, I think you'd be hard-pressed to find if you're an artillery collector, a better pair for the Napoleonic Wars. So lots of history there, lots of things to go with them. So from Waterloo to actually not a military medal, but a civilian one. And here we have something we haven't sold at auction for quite a few years now. It's a Carpathia medal. Now, you will probably know that the Carpathia is the ship that rescued the survivors of the Titanic after it unfortunately sank upon hitting an iceberg in April 1912, um, with massive loss of life. So you all know the story, the, the, you know, the famous film, all that sort of thing. It needs very little more introduction, other than to say that after the rescue of the survivors of the Titanic by the Carpathia, a rescue fund was instituted and the unsinkable Molly Brown, uh, the famous American uh, socialite and heiress, was one of the driving figures behind this fund. And it was decided that a medal should be struck to award to the crew, uh, the captain, officers and crew of the Carpathia, to show the gratitude of the survivors to what, for what they did. Um, this is a bronze issue. Now, it's unnamed, as with all the other medals, but it is attributed to second baker J. Renner. And we have a bit of provenance to go with that. We have an in, a, a couple of um, naval issue kit bags with uh, the name J. Renner attached and also a number. It is worthy of further research. Um, there was a J. Renner as second baker on the Carpathia, and so we're confident that it is exactly as it should be. Um, and, a, and a jolly nice thing it is, too, on its original ribbon, in very good condition, a lovely bronze issue. Only, I believe, about 180 bronze issues were bestowed personally by the captain of the Carpathia and obviously funded by the, uh, by the Survivors Fund. A lovely thing. It is lot 647, with an estimate of three to four thousand pounds. So, as an attributed Carpathia medal in bronze, a lovely thing. Um, we haven't sold one for a number of years, and I hope it'll do very well. 
So my final lot that I'm going to cover uh, is really rather fun. It's actually another civilian lot rather than military. Um, it is lot 262 in our sale, and it is this very, very fine royal household lot to uh, a royal chef, um, a chap called Chumi, Gabrielle Chumi, who apparently was known as Chummy by the royal family. So Chummy was a royal chef, and he was involved in all sorts of um, culinary uh, activities spanning a career of decades. As you can see from his medal group, he received the Royal Household Faithful Service Medal, the Royal Victorian Medal in Bronze, the various coronation medals, also, as you expect from Royal Household Group's various foreign medals, Portuguese, Spanish, Russian and Italian. But the particularly nice thing about it is that it also comes with a book. Uh, he wrote his memoirs uh, in retirement and describes in great detail cooking and creating these wonderful things for members of the royal family. He also became a uh, personal chef to Queen Mary. He was involved in creating the wedding breakfast for none other than our present Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh in, the, in 1953. Um, the coronation breakfast for her father, King George VI. And so was really thoroughly and heavily involved in all these very important royal occasions. And as you all know, with The Crown on Netflix and it being amazingly popular, um, it's, the royal activities are very much in the public eye at the moment. Uh, you know, Chummy was there. He was he heavily involved in all that sort of thing, um, admittedly behind the scenes, but he was very highly regarded by the royal family, clearly, to have received all these medals and these accolades. And a final point that I think is rather fun, he mentions in his memoirs um, uh, dealing with the Aga Khan, and at one point uh, discusses um, receiving a basket of mangoes from the Aga Khan as a personal gift to the royal family, with a little note attached uh, stating simply, my love. Now, they were a little bit nonplussed to start with as to exactly what this meant, until one of the staff realised that my love was one of the Aga Khan's best racehorses that was racing in a particular uh, derby. And um, was it a hint that they should place bets? Uh, indeed, they did. And to the delight of all, uh, my love came in uh, a firm first, won the race, and they were all quids in. Uh, so um, I'm sure they were very, all very thankful to the Aga Khan for that marvellous uh, and sort of somewhat um, under the radar tip. So lot 262, Chummy Chumi's medals, with an estimate of 1,000 to 1,500. And uh, they should certainly do better than that. I'd, again, I'd encourage you all to at least read the story. It's a wonderful thing. And um, the medals to a royal chef. Now, that covers everything uh, in my little selection for you today. So as Marcus mentioned earlier, our auction is over 8th and 9th of December. By that point, I hope we will able, be able to allow a few people in the room at least. And also by that point, uh, you'll be able to view in person if you wish. Please do contact us via email and telephone um, if you wish to arrange to look at things or if you wish to have further photographs of things or um, purely to have a chat. Um, and we will happily tell you more about these and many other lots. Um, everything is online via Spink Live. If you've done this before, you know how it works. Bid online, contact us for telephones, all that sort of thing. And um, we look forward to another very strong sale. Lots and lots of things on offer, nearly 1,600 lots. Um, and you will see at least Marcus and I on the rostrum over the 8th and 9th doing our thing. And uh, if, even if we can't see you, we hope you will enjoy seeing us. And um, all very best of luck from myself, Marcus, Harry, and the rest of the team here at Spink. Thank you. <laughs>